Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Reverend Fathers, dear faithful, this great feast, in the midst of many great feasts, obviously Christ the King, and then of course today, tomorrow, although not being a feast, a great day of the, the poor souls. And in fact, the rest of the month, we continue our extra prayers and masses for the holy souls. But today, we celebrate all of the saints. Of course, it's in fact Our Lady, Queen of Angels and, Saint, and all saints. An opportunity once a year to say, well, the year is only so long, we cannot fit all of the individual saints. There are so many thousands, maybe millions of them, so we need to have one day where we try to give them some honor, some veneration. But of course, the saints don't want that. There is not a saint in heaven saying, oh, I wish Mr. Joe Smith would give me some more honor. I've been helping him so much. No. The saints in heaven, the angels, they say, I wish Mr. Joe Smith would imitate some of these virtues that I used in, to get to heaven. I wish he would use those same tools. I wish he would wake up in the morning and say, how do I follow our Lord to get to heaven? The saints in heaven, uh, they don't ask these questions. They know. They see God face to face. But if you could put desires upon them, surely they follow our Lord who wishes the salvation of all of mankind. So we can ask this question, what must we do in order to be admitted into heaven with all the saints? Because we know, we, we cannot even describe the joys, the, the great joys of the saints in heaven. God has, has wiped away the tears from their eyes. They are freed from all sorrow, all mourning, all crying. All the sufferings and tribulations on this mortal life are gone. They're most intimately united with God, the source of all happiness. That's why St. Paul says to the Corinthians, I has not, has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered in the heart of man what things God has prepared for those that love him. This joy, this felicity goes on and on forever without interruption. We can't even imagine. We've never had a happiness that doesn't stop, that doesn't get interrupted, that doesn't fail to, to fulfill our, our desire. But in heaven, these saints have that. We want that also. So the question is always, what do we need to do? We always use, sometimes you see books that say that the secret to becoming a saint or uh, becoming saints for dummies or some sort of book that gives you the, the secret trick. Uh, just like these investors, you know, if you invest in this way, I've got a secret way to make money. Well, okay, fine. But with the saints, they, they were very clear. You could, you could summarize it in a different ways. They followed our Lord. They said, our Lord told us, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. It's very simple. We must deny ourselves, take up our daily cross, and follow our Lord. That's it. That's it. The saints understood this. This idea of denying themselves, taking up their daily cross, and following our Lord. So let's look a little bit about that today to remind ourselves of this simple but difficult strategy, this, this uh, let's say, blueprint to understand this. First of all, our Lord says, if you, come after, if you want to come after me, let your, you should deny yourself. We call that sometimes mortification. So many times in the confessional, the priest will say, you're having trouble with this problem. Are you doing any mortification? The person says, mortification, that's about three syllables too long for me. What are you talking about? What is this word? Mortification. It's denial of self. Curbing our 
inclinations, our desires, bringing it back in control, our senses, the eyes, the ears, the tongue, renouncing things that maybe they are good, maybe in themselves they are good. To eat food is not bad, but to mortify ourselves, to take away certain foods, to strengthen our will, to, to control our appetites, or not speaking when we could speak, in order to curb the use of our tongue, to mortify the, 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 the different parts of our body. Mortification is necessary for salvation. Why do we say this? We well, can look through the, throughout the Old Testament, through the New Testament, through the lives of the saints. You can see so many souls who tragically fell into sin or lost their, their souls without mortification. What did you see with... What do we think happened with King David? King David was filled with so many gifts in the Old Testament, but he did not control his eyes. He did not use his time wise. He was being lazy, lounging around late in the morning when his armies, armies were off fighting battles. And he's just, well, I'll just take it easy here. And King David begins to just leave, leave reign to the curiosity of his eyes. And he falls into adultery, and from that adultery into murder. What about Judas? Did not control his love of money. Did not resist that desire to always get a little bit more material things. He did not mortify that. And it leads to his betrayal of our Lord for 30 pieces of silver. So we know in the, in the, in the, in the scriptures, we see this necessity of mortification. Without it, Persons can easily lose their souls. If we give liberty to our senses, let those evil desires grow in our heart like a weed without plucking them out regularly. This is the necessity of denying ourselves and mortification. And the saints are very famous for this. In fact, almost too famous. When we think of a saint, oftentimes we can think of extreme mortification that they did. Everyone knows of the cure of ours and eating one or two or maybe even three potatoes a whole week, almost eating no food. St. Paul speaks about it in his, uh, his epistle. I chastise my body and bring it into subjection, lest perhaps what I preach to others, I myself should become a castaway. So many of the saints you know, they practice severe mortification. St. Jerome, uh, hurting his body with, with stones. St. Benedict rolling in a, a, in, a, in a large bush full of thorns or throwing themselves into icy lakes when they are being uh, attacked with temptations against the flesh. There's so many examples of that. Of course, these are extraordinary mortifications. We are called upon to do at least the ordinary ones, just normal everyday ones, not these phenomenal ones. As we say sometimes, some of these penances or mortification of the saints are better to be admired than to be imitated. They should fill us with a great, uh, let's say, wonder at the power of God's grace. But they are quite extraordinary. But they're still the ordinary ones that we should do, the denial of ourselves. But it's not only the denial of ourselves, it is their mortification to acquire virtue. It's not simply say, I do mortification so I don't sin. It's also, I need to mortify my, myself so that I can acquire virtues. We think sometimes that the saints, it's a very common mistake, they're just born like that. Well, this so-and-so saint, he was born with a really good Catholic family in a really Catholic time in history, in a really Catholic country, with a really great local uh, Catholic church down the road. Everything was set up. He was born with a, a silver spoon in his mouth, and everything just was easy as pie for him. And he didn't even have to work. He was just, he was just created like that. They're different. No, no. Any even simple reading of the lives of the saints, when you see their virtue, the exceeding humility, the incredible obedience, all of their, their chastity, all of these things, you think, well, yes, but it took years for them and great efforts to get to that level. 
You know, you see, they spend the whole night in prayer. Regularly, they will go hours and hours in focused mental prayer. But this is, this is, they're not born like that. You can read in the life of St. Aloysius Gonzaga. He was a young man, a young man. He was a young teenager. I was, he was 11, or, 11 or 12 years old. And he wanted to pray without distraction, which is, as you all know, unless you're quite gifted, it's not an easy thing to do. And he decided to, he made sort of a, a promise to himself, I will keep at this day in and out. Each day I will make an effort. I want to get to one hour, just one hour, well, that's a lot, one hour of non-distracted prayer. One hour while I do not lose my focus. I do not get distracted by other thoughts or someone walking through the house. I, I focus for one hour. If I don't make it, you know, if I go 10 minutes and I fall out of distraction, I start over. I start the clock again. If I make it 30 minutes and I lose focus, I start the clock again. So for much of the day, in his free time, he would, he would, he would do this exercise. It could be several hours. He had to start over again. He never quite made it. It took him months, months of practice, of hard work. And that spiritual focus, that spiritual mental work is the most difficult work there is. He spent months until he finally got to that 59th minute and 59 seconds, and he made it to the one hour. And after that, prayer became so much easier for him. But he spent months of hard work on his knees on the cold floor trying to obtain that, that great virtuous habit of focused prayer. By self-denial, by mortification, he made it. St. Aloysius was famous for this. He was also famous for the, the custody of his eyes. St. Francis de Sales, famously meek, did not come by it easily. He was quite a passionate man. The, the smallest thing would set him off, would excite him to great anger. He confesses later on in his writings that he, he obtained this meekness, that he's famous for his meekness. He said it took so many months and years of mortifications to acquire that. So denying ourselves through mortification, the saints themselves did it. And it's not easy, but it, it's worth the effort, of course. We need to follow the example of the saints in this matter. Deny ourselves with the grace of God. That be enabled to avoid evil and do good. So we have to mortify ourselves, deny ourselves. Then we must also take up the cross. It's absolutely necessary. We cannot avoid it. Both for sinners, both for those who are already in good virtues. It doesn't matter if you are already in, a, in the highest level of sanctity. You still need to carry the cross. Of course, for sinners, it's very necessary. God is always giving opportunities of grace for the conversion of sinners. He speaks to them through their conscience, their conscience reproaching them. Or maybe he speaks through a, a, a casual word. They hear of a sermon, or they hear a correction from a friend, or they, uh, they hear of some religious event that especially would apply to their soul, or the death of a close, a loved one. Someone dies and it gives them the opportunity to, to think about their own life and their own death, but they remain unconverted. Therefore, God acts like a good parent, who if his children do not listen and do not profit by correction, by gentle correction, by encouragement, by all these, let's say, positive things, the parent, the good parent, will severely punish them with the rod. He will use corporal Punishment, these bodily punishment to wake them up out of their error. And the same thing with the sinner. God sometimes will send through circumstances a great cross. He'll put them into the school of suffering, afflicting upon them maybe great poverty, maybe great sickness, maybe contempt from others, attacks from others. Maybe he allows their enemies to have power over them. This is all to open the eyes of the sinner, to soften their granite heart, that they might see the error of their ways, repent of their sins, and be converted to God. They must take up the cross. If they don't want to, God keeps sending them more and more. Here's another opportunity. These crosses are here for your conversion. You can read that in 
In the gospel, the parable, parable of the prodigal son who, who was wasting all of his life and all of his material things and all of his family and his family's reputation, making a terrible life. And it was only through the cross, the great miseries in which he had plunged himself, that he ends up eating the food of the pigs. That he realizes, wait a minute, I need to convert. I need to go back to my family. I need to stop living this sinful life. Through this horrible tragedy, he, the prodigal son returns. But it's not only for sinners that they need to take up the cross, that the cross is their salvation. It's also for those who maybe are not living in sin, those who are in the state of sanctifying grace, they still need help with their spiritual life, and the cross is their help. Sometimes without the cross, those in the state of grace would fall. You can see that so often. People, if life becomes very easy, there's no more cross, there's no more persecution, they begin to lose their faith. You can see that if you read your history, how many nations or races of people who were once Catholic, once they are no longer under attack, once they're no longer under persecution, they begin to lose the faith. It even happened in the early centuries. Sometimes between persecutions, these Christians, these early Christians who were phenomenal, there were uh, tons of them being martyred. But once the persecution stopped, many of them fell away from the faith. They needed that cross to keep the faith and to save their souls. You can see that so often. How, t how easily would we become lukewarm? Or we would forget God if there was no cross in front of us, no suffering for us to hold on to. How much would we forget about our desire of heaven if everything in this world is running so wonderfully, everything is going our way, everything is perfect for us. You start forgetting about heaven, you start to forget about your need for God. So sometimes it's very helpful, it's reg always very helpful that, some, that God offers us a cross. It could be our daily duties of life. It could be another person who is somehow persecuting us. It could be uh, bad health. It could be bad uh, financial things. It could be so many problems. Do not consider these something to run away from. They are perhaps, in the wisdom of God, necessary for the good of our soul, for our salvation. So we must deny ourselves and take up the cross and follow our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the, let's say, the, the great secret of financial success that only the saints know. No, it is our Lord who tells us this. We know what we must do. We must deny ourselves. We must take up the cross. We must follow Christ. Hold fast to the faith. Have a great love of the charity towards God and towards our neighbor. You will, or we will, if you try to do this, you will be beset immediately with difficulties. If you try to convert your life to, to turn back to God, you can be absolutely certain the forces of hell, the world, the flesh, and the devil, everything will start to fall against you. Everything will go wrong. Absolutely. You will have every possible reason to back off and to quit that great effort of the salvation of your soul. This happens oftentimes, you see this with retreats. You know, we have retreats coming up in February. Everyone's like, I'm going to go on retreat. And they make that good resolution. They sign up and they do it. And then every possible reason under the sun, all very good reasons come up that they should not go. They should change their mind. Everything. If we will be beset with difficulties, be ready for that. Do not let your courage fail you. God is with you, and with God all things are possible. Assisted with His grace, we can do it. Labor, combat, suffer with the saints on the, as, as they did on this earth. We will triumph and be forever happy with them in heaven. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.